Ados, we are ready to start when you let us know. Go ahead. Thank you. So we would like to welcome you all today to uh, this webinar, uh, Telling the Implementation Story, Program Reporting Standards for Sexual Reproductive, Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health. We're thrilled to have you join. We have over 387 registered participants from many, many countries around the world and really showing the uh, Im immense um, interest in, in, this, in this topic and tool. So it's my pleasure to facilitate this webinar today. Um, my name is Rachel Hinton, as you can see here in your slide. Um, as a, I'm a technical officer from the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health. And um, together with Implementing Best Practices Initiative and WHO, we're really pleased to support the dissemination and uptake of uh, this um, tool in practice. Um, next slide, please. So as many of you are aware, uh, this webinar is the second part of a series undertaken by Implementing Best Practices, PMNCH and WHO in response to um, what was seen as the growing need for member organisations, partners and, and other stakeholders to better document and tell their implementation story. Um, as you may know, there's, there's two documents supporting this. The first webinar focused on the WHO guide to identifying and documenting best practices and family planning programs. And today uh, we have the great opportunity to be discussing the program reporting standards for uh, sexual reproductive, maternal, newborn and child and adolescent health developed by WHO in partnership with the Alliance for Health Systems Research, um, Alliance for Health Systems Research. So we'll be hearing a lot more about this tool today and have the opportunity to discuss it, but just to note is a really important uh, resource and tool, not only for documenting the results of, of programming um, work, but also the details of implementation and context, which is central to understanding the processes and impacts of programs and to support the scale up and repli um, replication of these efforts. So next slide, please, just to very briefly go over the agenda. Uh, so we will be having four short presentations, uh, the first on the development of the, the program reporting standards, as well as three presentations focusing on the application of the PRS in practice, um, it's, uh, as well as its adaptation for documenting collaboration across sectors. We have um, the planned use from the, uh, on the, for the program reporting standards from a donor perspective of USAID as well as UNFPA's experience with piloting and implementing the, the PRS. Uh, following these um, short presentations, we will then have the opportunities for questions and discussions with um, our panelists. Uh, next slide, slide, please. So here's just the, the objectives of, of today. I won't go into too much detail. These were the, the same objectives for the series. But what I do want to um, raise your attention to is that you're more than welcome to submit any questions during the course of um, the panel discussions. And we will look at these at the end and um, offer the opportunity to our panelists and, and presenters to respond to these. Also that the recording will be, uh, sorry, the presentation will be recorded and the links will be shared at the end of the presentation. And just to note, there's some important handouts that can be downloaded. We have the program reporting standard document in three languages, Spanish, English, and French. So please make the most of, of those, as well as uh, two background peer reviewed papers, uh, manuscript, which is about the development of the PRS. So just to, uh, I think that's, that's it for now, just to go on to our, our next, slide please. So very quickly you'll, you'll, um, you'll have more information on uh, upcoming slides on today's panelists but I'm very pleased to introduce um, Osge Tunkup who's our um, uh, representative here from WHO working in the Department of Reproductive Health and Research and uh, following which um, um, we will be having a, a short presentation from Sharma Kuravilla who's a senior strategic advisor to the Family, Women's and Children's Health Cluster here at WHO in Geneva. Our next um, panelist today will be um, Stephanie Levy from 
USAID's Office for Maternal um, and Child Health and Nutrition. Um, and Stephanie is the Social and Behaviour Change Research and Policy Advisor there. And our final speaker will be um, Petra Chen Hoop Bender from um, UNFPA. And Petra is a technical advisor for Section Reproductive Health and Rights here at the um, UNFPA office in Geneva. So I'd like to take this opportunity now to hand over to Osge to, to give you some very important background and information on the, the program reporting standards tool. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Osge and for the next 10 minutes or so, I will be uh, speaking and taking you through the developments and the tool for the program reporting standards. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to start briefly by saying what is the need and the need was basically our frustration uh, while we were doing the research and the evidence synthesis to be able to see what are the best sort of the evidence that's out there in terms of what works and what doesn't work which is in terms of both in the systematic reviews, and I've just given some recent examples from the work that sort of initiated this, and also the guideline development processes where we were looking at the results, but then when we were looking to understand how these results came about, then we were seeing this black box. So the idea was how do we systematically collect data on what works and how, and in different contexts to strengthen this uh, knowledge base because it's critical for interpretation of the results and the lessons learned. Next slide, please. So then came the program reporting standards. And given the reach of WHO and the continuum of care, we didn't want to specify a certain thematic area. So we kept it uh, wide in terms of sexual, reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health to cover the range of the work that we are doing. So what we want to do with this is we wanted to go beyond research reporting because a lot of program work and implementation work is happening, not necessarily reported in the research articles, but also in gray literature and other forms of program documentation and communication. So we wanted to come up with a standardized template for describing program preparation, implementation and evaluation processes. And this document would be to be used by implementers as well as implementation uh, researchers in the field of uh, uh, sexual reproductive maternal newborn child and adolescent health. Next slide. So this here uh, is a four-step process that we followed to be able to develop the program reporting standards. And as you see, we've started in 2014 with a systematic review of existing guidelines and other reporting tools to be able to find which are the critical items that we should be looking into if we wanted to develop such a tool. So there in that systematic review, we've identified 50 items. And then we moved on to the step two, where we invited 80 uh, experts across regional and thematic areas representing different stakeholder groups from implementers to implementing, uh, implementing um, uh, agencies, the researchers, and also donors, and uh, and even the journal um, editors who would be publishing such a research implementation research as well. And we did between October 2015 and March 2016 three rounds of this Delphi process to be able to identify out of this 50 items which are the ones that are critical that should go into a tool which took us to July 2016, where we had a technical consultation. And in over uh, two and a half days, we basically went into the results of the Delphi process, looked into each and every item and to see how uh, we can, uh, if, if they made sense, what is the what the flow should be like and what's the language should be like for us for it to be speaking both to the researchers and to the implementers. After that technical consultation, we had the 24 items of the program reporting standards. But before the publication, we said we should pilot it before we actually put the version one out in the, in the field. So across four programs, the, the, the PRS was uh, piloted to, and then again tweaked and uh, sort of uh, devised and uh, changed to be able to come to the version. Next slide, please which is, uh, as you can see, and as you can 
download from the documents as well, which is published now as program reporting standards. For uh, the people who are out there who would like to read more about the detailed methodology and how it was developed, we also have the two manuscripts for you to be able to go through, which uh, inform the development process. Next slide, please. So what is PRS? PRS comes in, in this document, as you'll see, five sections, with, which consist of 24 items. So now uh, I'm not going to take you through all the uh, tw 24 items in detail, but just uh, give it to give you an overview of what those items are across program overview, program components and implementation, monitoring of implementation, evaluation and results, and synthesis. Next, please. So under overview, the idea is what was the, why was the program started and what did it expect to achieve? And here you have the items around rationale and objectives, start and end dates, what's the setting, what's the context. And for, for those of you who are interested in the context, you'll see across the items context is uh, discussed and, and uh, sort of uh, um, information around the context is required, not only in this one item, but across a number of items throughout the tool. Uh, who are the stakeholders, both in terms of implementing agencies and also other um, stakeholders who would uh, be part of the program? The funding sources, the theory of change and the logic model, and what are the human rights perspective that, that has been uh, taken into account as the program was uh, initially uh, started? Next slide, please. So this one is kind of if you if you if you well it's it's uh, it's the meat of the tool because this is where we are getting into what did the program do and how. Here we have four items on planning, piloting, and the components. Even though the components is seen as just one item, it actually has a lot of sub uh, sort of areas where uh, which which will help to understand and explain what the program is all about. It's about what type of activity, how is this activity being conducted in terms of methods? When? So what's the frequency? What's the intensity? All of these kind of uh, details, as you can say, devil is in the details that we would like to understand if you want to understand what was done in the field and by whom and what were the supporting materials. And then what were the quality assurance mechanisms that, was, uh, that were deployed in this process? Next slide, please. So here, if we've described what the implementation was all about, then we need to be able to monitor what the implementation was as well. So here we have uh, information on monitoring mechanisms, coverage, reach and dropout rates, adaptations, because this is another thing that's really critical. Unlike a randomized control trial protocol, the programs adapt as they go through and as they see the results or the process of implementation. So then it will be really critical to be able to document what were these adaptations in response to what. Then acceptability and feasibility of the program and uh, factors affecting implementation. Next slide, please. So here, it's about understanding how was the program evaluated and what were the findings about uh, what, if the evaluation was done, what were the results, and the item on cost, because this is another thing where we have very little information about programs and when we want to think about, about scale or um, uh, sustainability. So this, this item is about how, how much it costs, basically, or if there were any cost effectiveness analyses, then this would be here that we would um, uh, look into that. Next slide, please. The final part is about the reflection phase, if you will. So the program is done. It's it's the making states, making sense um, of what's been done, what happened. So here it's about talking about lessons learned, sustainability, scalability, and possibilities for implementation in other settings. Next slide, please. So we are very excited today because we are, for the first time, uh, soft launching, if you will, the website, which is an interactive website where you can go through the uh, items, you can uh, go through, you can fill out an online version of the checklist and also provide us feedback on, the, on this work. So the intention for this document is for it to be a living tool because we wanted to learn from the implementation experiences user experiences and then be able to uh, be updated and be more useful for the for the programs so for that purpose in this um, 
uh, website, you will find three versions. It comes right now in English, French, and Spanish. And we really are looking forward to hearing your feedback through the website as well. So, um, so this is the soft launch. You can access the website uh, through this uh, through this link. Next slide, please. So, in my final slide, I wanted to say what's next. Just brief words on uh, on um, where do we. Where do we want to go from here? Well, the first thing is how can we make sort of PRS available across different programs, across different regions, across different users, so that we um, we learn from this experience and see how it's working, where it's working, and how we can improve it, and how it's improving uh, your uh, processes, your programs, and your work. So one of the examples that I want to give briefly here is some of you may be familiar, WHO, UNFPA, UNICEF-led uh, Quality Equity Dignity Network for Improving uh, Quality of Care for Maternal Newborn and Child Health, which is spearheaded in nine countries right now. And in terms of documenting the implementation process for this network activities, uh, we will be using programs uh, reporting standards. And across the uh, um, other presenters and other um, organizations, you will be also hearing some examples of how this tool can be useful and uh, can be adapted. And the other thing that I wanted to highlight is um, one of the main uh, uh, sort of work streams of WHO is providing guidelines or the, the providing guidance and doing guidelines. And one of the issues about guidelines is we need to make sure that we have confidence in the evidence that goes into the guideline development process. And through this, we would like to develop a critical appraisal tool that could be used for program reporting standards. So when we systematically look at this evidence, we can also uh, incorporate it into the guideline development for process. So all this rich implementation evidence that's coming from the countries can also inform the, the, the guidelines uh, at, the, at WHO and other organizations. So next slide, please. With that, I would like to thank you and again acknowledge all the partners in this across WHO and leave it to my colleague Shiyama. Um, thank you, Oske. Thank you, Rachel, Annie, and all colleagues here. This is an absolutely fantastic resource. And um, thanks for the introduction. So I'll just jump straight into nice the discussion here. Um, Osge has just described a very systematic standardized process to develop the guide. And I'm going to discuss a really non-systematic standard <laughs> way that I found out about the guide, which was basically <laughs> heating up my lunch near the microwave and wandering <laughs> in the corridor and saying, goodness, this guide looks fabulous. And it seems like exactly what we need for a, a, a multi-country uh, series of studies that we're starting. And so I'll give you a little bit of background about these studies. Um, towards the end of the MDGs, um, with, with a lot of partners, WHO, PMNCH and others, had looked at um, countries that had made progress towards achieving the MDGs and spe specifically on reducing maternal and child mortality. And this was a multidisciplinary study in terms of having econometric epidemiological analyses, as well as um, identifying the countries empirically that were on track and then uh, having in-depth policy analyses and case studies developed. And we didn't know what we'd find, but one of the findings in fact was that about 50% of the impact came from health sector interventions, but the rest, for example, from education and women's empowerment and water sanitation and hygiene contributed the other half. And um, now into the SDGs with the fundamental premise of multi-sectoral action, this series of uh, country case studies is following on from this. In terms of really trying to understand how did programs successfully collaborate across sectors. And so this goes to the question that Osge was discussing earlier in terms of um, you know, documenting this in a way that you could actually draw out in a uh, rigorous uh, you know, um, way the key lessons that could then be adapted and uh, amplified uh, with all the 
you know, uh, rigor that goes into doing this. My second part of the non-standard issue is that um, in addition to Osgay's scientific background, I'm going to use the word standard as relating to jazz standards here, mm -hmm. where we've taken the program reporting standards and are doing a little bit of a riff on this. So um, if that's allowed, sorry, no, <laughs> Osgay. Um, so the slide that is up looks at the um, conceptual framework that we're using for the country case studies on collaboration across sectors. And you'll see that it's broadly about the program description, the context and stakeholders, and, and a little bit more in depth about the stakeholder incentives and definitions um, in, in, in entering into this collaboration, how the issue was framed and action planned, the implementation architecture and mechanisms, monitoring and accountability, the evolution of the program and scale up, as well as for sustainability, and then a results chain into which we've gone into more detail. But like I said, the program reporting standards offered um, the standard, the, the framework on which we could then bring in the evidence from a rapid review and synthesis of factors that uh, enabled successful collaboration across sectors. And so uh, this really was a standard on which we then built. What will be interesting is we are going to look at this um, as a methodological study as well, in terms of looking at how countries have used this. Um, and um, just to flag that this series of uh, studies would be published uh, <clears throat> based on the BMJ uh, publication process um, for launch at the Partners Forum uh, uh, in New Delhi in December. So watch this space on that. And we're very excited to be part of this exciting program. Over to you, Rachel. Excellent. Well, thank you, Sharma and Ozke as well for those, first of all, the, the really very helpful background and insights into the development of the tool. And also Sharma's um, explanation and description of how the tool has been adapted to look at collaboration across sectors, but across the, the program cycle as described and um, really thought through in the, in the PRS. So thank you very much. And I will um, ask for our next slide. Thank you. So we have, um, I'm very happy to introduce Stephanie from USAID who will, who will give us um, some very useful and interesting insights from, from the USAID perspective and on the use of the tool. So Stephanie, over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so my name is Stephanie Levy. As Rachel said, I'm a social and behavior change research and policy advisor through the Global Health Fellows Program in USA's Bureau for Global Health. Um, next slide, please. So I'll start really quickly about talking about the need for program reporting standards, or PRS as I may refer to them for the rest of the presentation. I'll start with a quick, not caveat, but explanation that as I work in social and behavior change, I'm really talking about my experience and my work at USA through that social behavioral community engagement perspective, though the need for these standards clearly expand beyond that scope. So to start with, we have found issues um, with quality and comprehensiveness of evidence, including context. And this has happened uh, multiple times, unfortunately. One key example is through the June 2013 Population Level Behavior Change Evidence Summit for Child Survival and Development. That was a USAID and UNICEF-led evidence summit. And it actually had over 100 experts reviewing hundreds of peer review articles and great literature to develop recommendations for policy programs and research. Um, one, of the, one of their findings, however, was that there were systematic reporting gaps for social and behavior change programming and evidence for child health. And so a broad conclusion was that often the basic information needed to assess the quality and context of much of the evidence they were reviewing was lacking. And then additionally, I would, I would mention that there was the broader conclusion that the field of social and behavior change needs to improve the way it reports successes and failures and the way that it collectively earns. And as a fun side note, um, these findings are actually published in a special supplement of the Journal of Health Communication in 2014, if anyone wants to look into that more deeply. 
But just to say that that was a very large and extensive undertaking that actually then highlighted these issues in terms of, as I mentioned, quality and comprehensiveness of evidence. And as you've seen and as you've heard, there were definitely other organizations going through similar processes and determining that there was a similar need. And then I would add on top of that, that, that I really view this as part of a broader need for improved evidence standards, again, from my perspective, at least in that social, behavioral, and community engagement intervention. So while this is a very welcome and useful addition around reporting, that broader need also includes ways, improving the ways that we build, assess, and apply evidence. And to that point, I'll just note that USAID is very happy to be part of a WHO-led partnership working on all of these facets and again, from my perspective, it's we're very excited about this work, all of this work, and its potential to move the entire field forward. So next slide, please. Moving to why program reporting standards are important for USAID, I'll mention as a quick background that a few of USAID's overarching agency goals include assisting in countries' journey to self-reliance and respecting taxpayer investments. And in order to help achieve these goals, the interventions that USAID supports should be evidence-based, of course. However, and especially in the social behavioral community engagement arena, sufficient high quality evidence can be lacking. So why are PRS important for USAID? USAID cares about the quality, effectiveness, and scalability of interventions. And the information captured in the PRS can help us improve our programming. Among other things, and as Oske highlighted, the new PRS facilitate a greater understanding of context. And currently, contextual factors such as norms, behaviors, social networks, existing policies, health system capacity, et cetera, are not reported on as part of routine program reporting or results, though implementation success is often actually tied to these factors. And as USAID supports and implements programs across a wide range of different contexts, this information is critical to better understand both successful and failed programming, to replicate and or adapt programs as needed, and to scale up effective interventions. Uh, next, the program reporting standards can help our investments be more cost effective. And here I would say that the PRS have the potential to help save money by not replicating studies and by strategically building on lessons learned from previous research and programming. And then finally, the point I'll make is that the PRS can improve existing efforts to document and publicly share research and program learning. Um, having accessible, systematic, comprehensive, and easily comparable data on research and program implementation would facilitate learning and replication and scale up of interventions for different populations and environments. The, I feel that this will improve USAID's ongoing efforts to document and publicly share research and program learning. As some of you may be aware, USAID has a development experience clearinghouse where publicly available reports and program documents are available for, um, for review. Next slide, please. In terms of plans for PRS use, um, Oske mentioned as part of the development that in late 2016, USAID was part of the group of organizations that were piloting the PRS on a completed national level program. Uh, I'll say from our perspective, all of the various reporting items were found across multiple um, program reporting documents, but they were scattered across these documents and some of the information was not really detailed enough to be useful. And so from our, our personal piloting experience and in talking with the other people and other organizations piloting, one of the top level conclusions was really among other benefits is that PRS can really help focus program design and reporting. So to talk about ways this is moving forward, it's my understanding some of our implementing partners have actually talked with WHO directly and offered to pilot the PRS, which we fully support and are really interested to see how that turns out and their findings and their feedback. We're also planning to find ways to incorporate PRS into USAID's awards and discussions about how to do so are starting. And I would say regardless, we do really strongly encourage our partners and key stakeholders to incorporate these program reporting standards as a best practice in their routine program reporting. And I will leave it there and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you.
So the final presentation is from me. I'm Petra Ten Hope, a technical advisor, sector reproductive health and rights at the UNFPA office in Geneva. And we were very much involved with this process um, because we do a lot of implementation in countries. So it really uh, was an honor to be able to pilot uh, these standards in one of our real programs and a real life program. So we used UNFPA's family health houses. Um, sorry, next slide. We used a UNFPA's family health houses program in Afghanistan that um, just in short is a program where a community selects a young girl to go to midwifery school while she's at midwifery school for a year or two years they build what they call a family health house which in essence is a small clinic um, with a living space for her but also um, you know for her to work on maternal newborn child health in that area and when she comes back that's where she goes and and she works for that community and we see in the in the run of the years after that uh, when she starts up she becomes really a very important component of the community and takes on much more than maternal newborn and child and adolescent health so it really because she becomes kind of the core care provider in the area and what's really interesting in that is that um, in Afghanistan, this program is now uh, has now established 80 of these family health houses. So we did have a good amount of materials or a good amount of information to compare. So we ran um, the, the standards as they then were. They have been changed a little bit, of course, due to the things that we learned. And I've listed a few things here for you to, um, to, to look at and to think about. Uh, because the value of doing this analysis really stands and falls with the level of detail that there is available. Um, it sounds like, you know, you can just tick a couple of boxes and say, OK, so we meet these reporting standards. But really going into detail and making sure that you have data from a programme like this, but also into other programmes that are comparable, really, really makes that big difference. And that's why we're so happy with these standards being available. One of the things that we weren't clear enough on in our in our family health houses program is who's the target population. And some of that was because the target population actually changed over time. It started with maternal newborn child health, but it then went actually to everybody in the community. And then um, the, the next piece that, that was a learning part for <coughs> us was that in def different regions within Afghanistan, they uh, were putting um, family health houses up but with different scopes and with different um, reasons for making for being set up so that again was something that you know as a program develops it changes that there's important it's important to be able to capture those kinds of details and then finally um, that what we learned from the piloting phase is that it's important to do a cost analysis and that was that point has been made before by colleagues who've just spoken but if you really want to be able to sell this, uh, having a good standard for doing cost analysis really also makes you able to make a solid return on investment discussion for new investments, for other donors, for other countries, and of course, for the country and the government itself. Next slide, please. So then um, if we think about how we can implement this, there, there are you know, lots of programs and lots of ideas that are being further developed. Um, one of the ones I like very much, for example, is a group antenatal care where um, women provide, uh, you know, kind of come together in a group and, and um, do some of the basics like weighing them, themselves or each other and taking blood pressure and then also have direct interaction with midwives for the more um, health oriented or the, the, the growth of the pregnancy oriented care and that's what I think is something that's growing it's exponential a lot of people are interested in it it's very successful it's loved by women and by midwives alike so that, that would be something that could really be a good next uh, topic to, to take on in the um, uh, in using these standards um, we also have a, an obstetric fistula reintegration program, which is really difficult to quantify and to qualify. You can't just say we have X number of women who've been reintegrated because it's a difficult process. So again, these kind of reporting standards really make that comparable. And then also the, the kind of, you know, backbone of uh, maternal newborn child health in many developing countries, emergency obstetric care would be a program that um, you know, has existed for a long time and would be could be involved in these kind of um, in, in looking from an implementation perspective at these standards using these standards. 
There's also changes in approaches. People are thinking differently, from moving from maternal death surveillance and response to maternal and perinatal death surveillance and response that can be supported through the standards. And there are programs that are, for example, like midwifery that are in lots of countries. And, you know, we have a program ourselves that is in 40 countries to strengthen midwifery, but that you can then start comparing across regions and countries and continents and also make um, the lessons learned and, and the success stories more available to colleagues in other areas. So then to the last slide. So um, if we're looking um, at the future of this, uh, and, and Oski already said, uh, it's important to know what real success means and what real failure means. And failure in that regard, not as something that's only gone wrong, but as an opportunity to, to learn. And with being able to compare this, you know, across countries and, uh, and have uh, real feedback and real information on, on what went right and what, what went wrong. Um, I think the, the, the standards are going to be a core component of our work going forward. It gives us the capacity to share lessons learned in a more, um, more underbuilt way, underpinned with real examples, with the reality on the ground, and also gives us an opportunity to look at, so where are the gaps? What are we missing? Where do we actually need to put new research in? Um, you know, and not say we're going to update this standard or update that guideline, but where are the, really the parts where we could get greater impact if we knew a little bit more about how it works? And then the last piece that I find very interesting in, in our work is that, you know, we tend to compare like with like. So we compare programs of the UN across the UN and the humanitarian across humanitarian and, and you know, other areas. But we could actually now compare things in a different way from the kind of organization or the place that they're working or the issues that they're covering, you know, in urban or rural areas, in humanitarian or sexual reproductive health and rights settings. So it, it really becomes a strong point for uh, the whole uh, group of organizations working in our area that, that you know, we have a, a more of an opportunity to talk to each other and say, well, in, in our setting or in this situation, this program was successful, but if you are going to be applying it to somewhere else, it might be quite a different story. So then just to leave you with the last slide um, for a picture and thank you very much for your um, participation for listening, thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Petra, for that really insightful um, uh, presentation on the use of the uh, program reporting center tool and its potential use in other areas. And I think that's very exciting um, to see um, coming from UNFPA and and other partners. So I want to take this opportunity to. Um, uh, to for you to send in any questions that you might have so that the um, panelists can start to respond to those questions um, so please do uh, send any send any um, questions in now and we can look to answer those questions for you anything at all in terms of of, of something that's piqued your interest and you would like us to give more information on. But what I can do for now is just ask um, Osge if she would um, like to give us a little bit more information on the how, how people can provide feedback on the PRS and what are the opportunities for doing so. Osge. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is actually the launch of this and the, the guide was in, on September 17 in uh, South Africa. So it's very, it's very new and uh, we, that's why we just launched the website today as well. And one of the things, as I mentioned, is uh, the importance of feedback. Therefore, on the website, when you go through the website, um, uh, the, the page, there's a specific feedback form that you can fill out in terms of uh, providing us uh, feedback uh, when you use the tool, when you look at the tool. So any feedback is welcome um, at this point. And then we really are going to be sort of, as we are um, sharing and disseminating the website, this feedback opportunity will be something that we will be highlighting because as I said, it's a living document and we really would like to improve it based on continuous feedback and continuous use. Okay. 
Excellent. Thank you, Olga. So I would just, um, we've received some, some questions. Um, so I'd just like to, to, uh, to pose the, one of the first questions that I'm, I'm seeing here. So first one, uh, Stephanie, is for yourself. Um, so USAID um, to you is a question here is, can we start mentioning these guidelines and proposals that we're submitting now? even before the agency develops its own approach to promoting them? Would that be helpful to our proposals? So um, please, uh, Stephanie, what, what would your advice be to, to our um, participant's question? Sure, thanks, and it's a, it's a good question. I think I would, I think they are useful. I think they are worth mentioning as a, at this moment as a tool to help maybe standardize and and organize your planned um, maybe your your planned potential indicators and your PMP not to get too far into the weeds that said I do want to just be very clear that there it wouldn't be an added advantage in an evaluation of a proposal necessarily at this point. That's that's a piece that I just want to be very clear that mentioning them I think could really speak to being thoughtful and organized and focused and having a focus perhaps also on not constant revisiting of these standards but recognizing how they can be helpful from the design pro part all the way to evaluation of a program. So the short answer is I, I think they can be helpful in speaking to your thoughtfulness in, in approaching evaluation and reporting, um, but I just want to make sure it's clear that that wouldn't be an, an added bonus um, when people are evaluating proposals for USAID programming. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Stephanie. Um, so uh, I'm just having a quick look at a, a, a few questions now because a few are just coming in. So if you'd bear man, bear, bear with me. So I think, um, uh, Oske, there's a question here related to context. And I think that's been something that's come up quite a bit in, in the conversation, you know, that we really need to think through and, and uh, think about and document context a lot more. Um, is the, the issue is around, it's, it's been mentioned several times, and is there, a, is there a sort of, you know, template or frame that can be used uh, to describe the context? So when we're, just, when we're responding to contextual issues, we're able to respond in the same way. Sure. Thank you very much for the question. And context has been something that was very, very heavily debated along through the Delphi process and also in the technical consultation. Uh, that's why if you look at the guide as well on page five, there's a uh, specific uh, sort of description of role of context across the guide. So the, the way we've been thinking about context and the reason why it comes uh, across in different uh, elements is because we consider it kind of as not just the backdrop of the program implementation, but context as it interacts, influences, modifies, and facilitates or constrains the, the program or the intervention or the, the implementation effort. That's why uh, you'll see, for example, more specifically, we have uh, context related um, items on when we talk about program context, when we talk about um, feasibility, when we talk about adaptation, when we talk about factors affecting implementation, all of these items actually speaks to the context um, and to try to understand and un sort of uh, uncover what, what's the context that the, the implementation is taking place. Excellent. Okay. Yes, I mean, context is certainly um, throughout the, the tool and important uh, across. So uh, thank you very much for, for keeping the sending the, the questions in. We have um, a question here related to um, who's the primary audience? Who should, who's it intended primarily for, pr primarily for? Is it, for example, donor funded projects? Is it for uh, you know, national reporting, is it, who, who is it for and how can it, not how can it be used, we know that, but who is it intended for primarily? Um, I'm going to ask um, uh, 
it's, everyone wants Everyone's to answer excited. because <laughs> because the answer is everyone <laughs> because the idea here is and that's why when we were doing the Delphi and the technical consultation as well that's why we reached out to different stakeholders from journal editors to donors to implementation researchers and implementing uh, agencies because all of them can actually uh, use this tool and we, we aim, for example, a donor organization can say, we would like our programs to be reported accordingly, which is a very strong statement and which is very helpful, whereas a program implementer can actually use this tool to be able to sort of even, even think about how the program report could be written in terms of which sections, what kind of information should be provided. So uh, the, the one word answer to your question is everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, there was a lot of excitement to answer that question because it is uh, for everybody to use. As as we have, uh, as as Sharma was um, ex explaining today, it's been used to to document programs that are working across sectors and the different questions that can be asked about that collaboration um, within the the framework of the program reporting standards. You know, looking at the same things, factors affecting implementation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, we have an interesting question, another interesting question that um, Stephanie, I'd, I'd very much like to come over to you again, please, just related to when you were, you know, piloting. Um, do you have any any data to show that this um, that that was gathered um, that's available or, or otherwise that was gathered using this tool that that is available or that you can you can describe to us today? Um, and if at all, how it how it affected you know the, the program at, at all. But in terms of the data that was captured and and used through the piloting um, uh, element, is is there any sort of insights you can give us on that, Stephanie? Sure. Um, yeah, I will give you what what I can. So one piece, um, which hopefully makes clear, is that that program had ended already. So it really was kind of a retrospective piloting or desk review to make sure that we, um, to see does this make sense, are we missing key items, can you find all these items already? And I, as I mentioned in my in my slides, and then I'll get back to the, the broader part of the question, was we could find every item across these, um, all these documents, but they were scattered and some of them were hard to find and the detail was actually lacking significantly in some of these. So there were questions that I think we had from USAID as piloting these and other organizations as well, if memory serves, around the, the quality of the answer you're getting. So it's not just ticking a box and saying we mentioned this. It's really needing at certain times a, a deeper understanding. So the, the data such as it was, was, was kind of at that level. We didn't pull actual, um, actual detailed pieces across this, it was what we were looking at was a five-year program um, at a national level. And so none of our findings from this desk review or this piloting affected the program because it was completed. But I will say one of the things that we had found was that at the national level, any substantial program at the national level is really going to require mm, maybe reporting on some of these items multiple times because some of these seem to be at the smaller activity level. And that was one of our findings and part of our feedback was that we couldn't answer all of these sufficiently um, with enough useful detail just at that national level. And if there are multiple activities around multiple, this was a single health area project, but if there are multiple health areas and many different types of activities, then those are going to need to be broken out almost into their own subset. Some of those reporting standards may need to be reported on against each of those activities. Um, so I, that, that's what I have. I hope that's somewhat helpful as an answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'd just like to note that we, we certainly are receiving a lot of interesting, um, a number of you know, really excellent ideas um, coming from the group not, you know, um, and, and comments related to certain aspects of the tool, particularly um, an online repository. And I know that um, there are discussions related to an online repository in terms of what it might look like, how it would be used, et cetera. So just to note for, for some of those ideas related to that, those sorts of discussions are certainly underway. 
and um, we'll be um, watch this space basically I think is is what we can say for now um, so that is very very good and um, we'll just see if there's any any other um, questions coming in um, yes uh, just one one question that bear about uh, research versus programs I think um, it, it's not necessarily to say that this is only for non RCTs but even if it's an RCT and uh, one of our colleagues is describing some of the complex intervention RCTs it's really not enough space for example in a research article where you can describe the actual intervention and I think that when you're thinking about complex interventions and complex programs about program evaluations it's really we see the role of PRS as to be able to give the implementers and researchers a chance to be able to describe more systematically what the intervention was and with all the different components so I think we uh, we see a role for for that as well and that that could be useful for for your work as well And in terms of just to quickly uh, highlight the, the section four of the tool uh, or the, the, um, the guide, and you can find it on the internet version, web-based version interactively as well, describes what needs to be under or kind of like guidance on completing the items for the PRS, which clarifies some of the questions about which should go where or which uh, uh, issue should go under which mm -hmm. item. So I. I think the section four is also a good sort of clarification beyond the tool or describing how to complete the tool in terms of uh, what what is required or what is uh, proposed under each item. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a question related to you know engagement of countries in the use of the the PRS, for example. I know uh, UNFPA, for example, has been talking about future use of of the PRS and likewise Osga you may have some some thoughts of of this so in, in terms of Petra taking it forward um, is there sort of any specific examples of countries that you you have in mind yet in terms of using the PRS or you're not at that stage yet what's the sort of planning there so we have a number of programs I listed some of them in my presentation um, one of the most of which fall under our maternal health work and uh, that includes then uh, the maternal perinatal death surveillance and response work and the work in emergency obstetric care um, I've, and we have obstetric fistula in there so those are the three areas i mentioned as places where we, we would be taking these standards forward um, we have strong reporting standards for all of those programs in the countries i think there are 47 countries currently in our maternal health thematic fund so those would be the ones that we start with um, and it depends on the level of development of their program in that in the individual countries as to whether they are at a stage where doing a PRS would make sense or whether they're still in very much in the, in the early stages of setting up a program. It changes from country to country as they kind of evolve and grow into capacity to really effectively address maternal health and, and child health and newborn health. So I think there's a good opportunity for, uh, for us to learn lessons in implementation across these three areas. Um, but then also uh, within the work around midwifery, um, which is a much broader program and is, is um, laid out and run uh, out of more than 40 countries. So uh, I, I'm not, we have a new um, strategy being developed for that and finalized it. We soon will be ready. So we can definitely start uh, picking up the program reporting standards from the beginning of that program rather than adding them into something that has started already and then trying to kind of tailor the, the results we have to fit with the PRS. Exactly. So the PRS can be used as a proposal to, to support proposal development um, as well as program reporting. So using it at the start of a program and, you know, design and proposal writing all around that point as well as all the way through. So that's, that's the adaptability and flexibility of this um, really useful tool. Um, so I think um, so I think um, if there's no more questions coming up um, from the group, we uh, from uh, um, is just just before we we close, is there an electronic version available in Word, for example?
in PDF. It's writable PDF. It's a writable PDF. On, on the website. Okay, so um, excellent. So thank you for that rapid response. So there's an um, electronic version, which is a writable version on the, the website that you've been provided with today. So that, again, is a, another very useful resource. People can sign up on their email, and once they fill it in, the website would automatically send them a PDF version of their report. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, I just um, would like to, to very much thank um, all of our um, participants who joined this uh, excellent uh, discussion today on the PRS. We very much appreciated your feedback and comments and ideas and, and questions. We had quite a few and apologies for not being able to get through them all because um, time is, is short. However, um, you know, there's opportunities to, to comment and, and give feedback in, in different ways. So please do go ahead and we really recommend and, and hope that you can start to use this, this um, resource and tool in your, your programs, your research, et cetera, going forward. And we, we wish you um, good luck with that. And, and the, um, we look forward to feedback on the, on the program reporting standards on the website. Um, and for now, I would, so thank you all for joining today. I'd also like to, to thank our, our four panelists. So Osge, um, Sharma, Petra and um, Stephanie for, for joining today and, and uh, for giving us some really great insights into the development and also use of the tool. From the, from, um, the Implementing Best Practice team, obviously those, uh, our colleagues who supported putting this webinar together, so Agos, Asa, Maria and Nandita, and also our WHO colleagues here, so Annie Portella, another contributor to the development of this webinar and the, the PRS tool itself. And um, myself from PMNCH, we be very much uh, looking forward to working with our members and supporting um, the dissemination of this really great tool throughout our networks as well and supporting the um, uptake going forward. So um, on that note, I would just like to thank you all and to highlight that there are websites available. The recording will be available on, um, I think we have this, this uh, yes, we have the slide up here, which shows um, where everything is available. And the recording is also available on, um, you would have seen the, the slide, here it is now. Um, and please also follow everyone on Twitter and um, continue to, to support this, this great work going forward. So thank you very much for joining and um, we look forward to getting your feedback on the, the use of the tool. Thank you. Thank you.